I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to MJH Live, the online public program series of New York's Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust, from where I am Zooming in today, finally, after many months of uh, Zooming from home. Uh, my name is Samantha Shokin. I manage public programs at the museum, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the season two launch of Those Who Were There, Voices from the Holocaust, the only podca podcast dedicated to sharing Holocaust history through the first-hand testimonies of survivors and witnesses. Today, we will take a behind-the-scenes look at the production process and get an advanced preview of the forthcoming season, which is a co-production of the Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies and the Museum of Jewish Heritage. Those Who Were There draws on recorded interviews from Yale University's Fortunoff Ar Video Archive, which comprises the oral histories of more than 4,000 Holocaust survivors and witnesses. The podcast's second season focuses on a collection of 600 testimonies recorded by the Museum of Jewish Heritage in affiliation with the Fortunoff Video Archive during the 90s. Moderating our conversation today is Trevor Walsh, a co-producer of the podcast second season who is also the collection's project manager at, at the museum, manager, excuse me, where she is responsible for managing the museum's collection of 3,800 oral history interviews with Holocaust survivors, liberators, rescuers, and witnesses. Previously, Treva led the processing team at The History Makers, the nation's largest African-American video oral history archive. Treva studied anthropology and philosophy at the University of Chicago and is a core member of the audiovisual archiving group, Transfer Collective. Before I turn it over to Treva, who will introduce our panelists, I'd like to remind our viewers that today's program is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube in the coming days. I'll send out a, a link to the YouTube video in my follow-up email. We will also leave time for a Q&A session at the conclusion of the program. To participate, please submit your questions and comments into the chat box. Thank you. And now, please welcome Trevor Walsh. Thank you so much for the introduction, Sam. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce the panelists, the creators of the podcast, Those Who Were There, Voices from the Holocaust. Uh, Eleanor Risa, Nahani Rouse, Stephen Naren, and Eric Marcus. Um, Eleanor Risa is the host of Those Who Are There. She's been a director, actor, singer, and writer for 30 years and is fluent in Yiddish and English. Her most recent engagements include acting on Broadway in Paula Vogel's Indecent and in the HBO miniseries The Plot Against America. She was honored with a Tony nomination for directing Those Were the Days and last year co-created, directed, and performed in Migration series from shuttle to stage at Carnegie Hall. Risa hails from Brooklyn and her parents lived through the Holocaust. Nahani Rouse is also is a co-producer of Those Who Were There. She is also the host and producer of Can We Talk, the podcast of the Jewish Women's Archive, which shares stories and interviews at the intersection of gender, history, and Jewish culture. Nahani is also senior producer of Making Gay History, an award-winning podcast drawn from Eric Marcus's interviews with LGBTQ LGBTQ rights activists. She was a founding staff member of the media organization Just Vision, which highlights the grassroots efforts of Palestinian and Israeli peace builders and nonviolence activists. Um, Stephen Naren is the director of the Fortunoff Video Archive, as well as a co-producer of those who were there. He has worked as an archivist and librarian since 2003, when he received his MSIS from UT Austin. He also holds a Magister in Jewish Studies and History from the Free University of Berlin and the Center for Research on Antisemitism at TU Berlin, as well as a BA in History from the University of Kansas. As the director of the Fortunoff Video Archive, Stephen works with researchers to share access to the collection and is responsible for initiatives such as the digital preservation and the development of a modern access system for the archive's materials. And last but certainly not least, um, journalist and author Eric Marcus is a co-producer of Those Who Are There. He's also the founder and host of the award-winning Making Gay History podcast, which mines his decades-old ar audio archive of rare interviews to bring LGBTQ history to life through the voices of those who lived it. Eric also founded and chairs the Stonewall 50 Consortium, which brings together 240 nonprofit organizations committed to producing programming, exhibitions, and educational materials related to LGBTQ history and culture. So I think I'll start off our discussion um, with this question for Stephen. Um, Stephen, can you tell us a little bit about the origins of those who were there? Um, what were your motivations in creating it, and how did the production team come together? 
Okay, thanks. Thanks, Trevor. Just one small correction. I'm a magister dropout, so uh, I never completed my magister. I don't want that to, to, to go. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, so stay in, st stay in school, kids. Anyway, um, so I just wanted to thank Samantha and everyone at the museum for, for hosting this event, and especially you, Trevor, for uh, rekindling the the, the shidduch between the Fortune of Archive and the Museum of Jewish Heritage. We're really excited to be producing uh, the season of the podcast with you in the museum. After all, the Video Archive is and has always been a cooperative endeavor. Um, while the archive began as a grassroots effort in New Haven to record survivor testimony back in 79, the project quickly grew and spread to like-minded communities around the world, North America, South America, Europe, and Israel. And the archive um, has always worked with these communities to set up these affiliate projects, to train local interviews, uh, to serve as an institutional repository for all of the recordings, whether they were recorded in Paris or in online mass. So uh, it's, it makes sense that we should, again, turn this uh, type of cooperation when we, we work on a new effort like this to bring these archival materials back to the community they were recorded. And the Museum of Jewish Heritage, was the most productive Fortune Off affiliate in, in this effort. It um, recorded survivor testimony. They did something like 600 testimonies. So it's fitting that we work together to bring these materials off the shelf. Uh, and I use the shelf metaphorically since everything's digitized now. I should say something like bring them off the high density data tape and directly into people's phones and earbuds and into their, into their living rooms. Um, so the question is how the team got together, right? Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, it's quite simple. Uh, it's all Eric Marcus's fault. Um, <laughs> it's your fault, Stephen, because you sent me an email saying, uh, what do you think? <laughs> well, it, it, okay. So, but I'm a ravenous consumer of podcasts. I'm a lover of radio. I love the sort of intimate experience of the spoken word and um, you know the ability to sort of sink into a program and just push everything else out and uh, a friend of mine Susie Lechtenberg who works at uh, another podcast called More Perfect at WNYC it's a great podcast if you haven't heard it um, suggested Eric's podcast to me I listened to it and I fell in love with the people in the series and I have to say that the, the history of LGBTQ rights is not something I'm intimately familiar with, but, but his use of oral history to tell this story um, was really very moving. Um, and I, I felt like he would be the one who could take these materials as difficult and, and harrowing as they can be and produce a meaningful, a meaningful series. Well, Stephen, when you first um, contacted me, I, I warned you that, actually we, we met in New Haven to talk about this project. Um, I, I at first said yes, and then said no, that we didn't have the capacity to do it. Um, and then spent this, and I knew you'd be, you were terribly disappointed. And I spent a sleepless night thinking, I really have to do this project. But I also have to be honest with you that I was new to podcasting. I spent you know, decades as a journalist and a writer but Making Gay History is my first podcast, and um, I'm the host, uh, not quite the producer. Nahani's now the producer. We had a producer prior to Nahani. So I was scared to death of actually taking on a project this uh, important because these stories are so precious. Um, so I warned you that I, if you could stand working with someone who barely knew what he was doing, um, and you said yes. And, uh, and, that's when I, I, and that's when I got in touch with Nahani. We had connected um, previously over our own respective podcasts and Eric contacted me saying, you know, what do you think Holocaust testimonies, sort of the format that we're using for making gay history? Um, and honestly, the second that you asked me to join this project, I knew that I was going to say yes, um, because it's just, it, it's, it feels like something that I would never walk away from and that I would, no matter how busy I was, I was always going to make room um, to do this because, you know, these are stories of people who survived 
unimaginable horrors. And just to, to be in a position to help share these stories is just something that I, I would never shrink from. And I, and I feel, you know, humbled has become a very overused word, but it really feels appropriate in this situation. That is, I, I, I feel honored and humbled to, to work on this project. Um, and and it's, it's really been one of the more rewarding and meaningful projects that I've worked on in my life. I should add that um, when Stephen first contacted me, I thought uh, Holocaust was the last thing I wanted to work on. Um, I was, I grew up in a neighborhood of Holocaust survivors. My best friend next door was the child of refugees from Berlin. Ziggy, who owned the candy store where I bought newspapers and loved them home as a child, had numbers on his arm. At Hebrew school, our rabbi would warn us when we were misbehaving, six million died, you're lucky to be alive. And my parents were also very interested in the Holocaust and read everything. So by an, from an early age, I, I'd been, um, uh, I was extremely familiar with, with the Holocaust and I thought I can't consume one more thing related to it. But I also felt an enormous responsibility <clears throat> that as an adult now I had the capacity to help bring these stories that are in this archive um, uh, into the light of day. I mean, not that they, Stephen, they don't just exist. Well, they do exist on the high density tape but most people aren't going to sit and watch three hours of, of video testimony. Um, I knew from Making Gay History, from my archive, that people weren't gonna to listen to three hours of audio tape sitting at the New York Public Library, but in a form like a podcast, which is so easily consumed, especially by young, younger generations, that this would be an ideal way to bring these stories to life. And from the beginning, I thought there is only one person to be the host of this podcast. Um, and that was someone I met at the Carlisle Hotel uh, <laughs> in the early 2000s at a concert for Elaine Stritch, Eleanor Risa, director, actor, singer, star of Yiddish theater. Um, parents are, uh, were Holocaust survivors and Eleanor, you can certainly explain more. But I called Eleanor and said, Eleanor, what do you think? And, and we auditioned several people, but I always had my, uh, you were always my favorite. Well, but thank, thank goodness. I mean, uh, and that I, you know, the audition and I thought, oh my God, I have to audition to be like a host of a Holocaust podcast. I mean, just look at my life. I am the host of a Holocaust podcast, whether you hire me or not, I'm the host. <laughs> um, yeah, well, uh, like Nahani, I'm extremely honored uh, to be a part of this. And, and I feel like all the roads have led here. And it's, for me, it's a culmination of all the work I've ever done. Um, and, and I'm so interested in how this affects the world today. And it's so clearly important is a weak word to use, but it's so vital in smelling the news of the day to learn what was news yesterday. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful project that I'm uh, terrifically honored to be a part of with all of you and the survivors and, and that my family survived. And I must say, I thought I was inured. You know, I've heard every story, I've met every survivor. It's not true. It's really not true. There's, there is a story for everyone that has value and resonates. So, it's, you know, applause to y'all really. I want to pick up on that thread later, but I do want to make sure that I ask um, for Eric and Nahani, you both um, are involved in other podcast projects. How did that work kind of influence or help prepare you for your work with Holocaust te testimony for those who were there? I mean, you know, I can say that in, in some ways, nothing can prepare a person um, for sitting and listening to hours and hours of, of this kind of testimony. Um, so like that's for starters, but then obviously 
I have technical skills and sort of more personality related skills that I've developed over my career that allow me to, um, you know, that's like in the area of deep listening and sensitivity that you, in an, in an approach to um, telling people's stories of loss and struggle that I have done a lot, that I had done a lot already in my career leading up to this. Um, and then I guess more technically thinking as an audio storyteller about narrative arc and pacing and, and that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, there is certainly a way, as Eleanor just said, every one of these stories is new um, and different. And every first listen, I listen just as like a, a, a person <laughs> listening. And then, and we'll get into this more, I know, later in the discussion, but it, um, I really don't listen, I really listen like as a person first. And I feel like I listen as a professional later in the process. So I think that my my capacity to dissociate, which is actually not a good thing, but because of early childhood trauma, I'm very good at dissociating. So when I listen to, and, and the honey has the bigger lift because she listens to the entire uh, uh, testimony of each person. I listen to Nahani's uh, uh, raw, uh, initial cut and I read the whole transcript, but I have for whatever reason the capacity to step back and not be emotionally blasted by what I'm hearing until I listen to something close to the, to, to the final with Eleanor's uh, narration and uh, after Nahani's finished the editing and it's been to the audio engineer, then I listen to it fresh as if I'm uh, listening to it the first time and I'm always deeply affected. Um, I had anticipated having nightmares um, because I can't, go, I can't see horror movies. Um, I'm very suggestible, so I, I was afraid that I would have uh, nightmares out of this, but not at all. Um, and one of the joys actually has been, um, we have a, a few people we featured um, who are still alive who are survivors. And one of the joys has been talking to uh, survivors and also their children uh, because we gather photos from people and need additional details. And it's just been a joy. Um, I have spoken to Sally Frischberg, and I know we're going to see a, a video clip of her shortly. Um, we've spoken three or four times now, and uh, probably two hours, uh, just so I could gather a few sentences of facts. And there is such life in her voice. Um, and I'm so moved by that, that people who lived through such trauma still managed to, as I think Eleanor has said, to live, to love, to cook, to dance, that they still had lives. No one, uh, what's also impressed me is people uh, acknowledging the trauma that they've lived through and how they have been affected by it. Um, and um, one in particular from this season, um, Annalise Hertz, who talks at the end of the episode about um, being changed, that she wasn't, if someone asked her, uh, was she glad that she survived? She said she couldn't say definitively and that she was in a way half dead. And that just takes my breath away. So um, I feel also as Eleanor talked about bringing her whole life's work to this project, I feel like everything I've done in my life, including 28 years of therapy with the same therapist um, has prepared me for this work because you can't come to this work uh, without some life preparation. It's, it, I, I feel value in being almost 62 years old in this project. Um, and we allow Stephen to work with us, even though he's still in his 40s. Oh, and Eleanor and uh, Nahani too. <laughs> <laughs> well, and me too, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I, I don't know, you, you, you stumbled and I think that was an error. Thank you. <laughs> Um, we've, so we've talked a little bit about this, the proximity to trauma and the way that the podcast and our previous life experiences bring us close to this, but also this gulf of distance that's always there. Um, I'm wondering how, are there any personal experiences or family histories that, that influence your work that you'd want to share with, with the listeners? 
Um, I guess I'll first ask Eleanor, but then kind of open it up to everyone. Um, you know, it's, uh, my family were, uh, lived through the Holocaust and my father lived through Auschwitz and, um, and, uh, I've just, and they're both gone. Both of my parents, uh, left this planet. One, my father in 78 and my mother, uh, in 86. So they kind of missed the curiosity section of the Holocaust. They lived during the time when it wasn't spoken about. And so I didn't learn things from them except um, by looking at family photos and it was all about who was missing and who, you know, who this person was in the photo, that brother, that cousin who is gone. Um, so it, it's taken me, I've been doing my own research on their lives and shockingly there's information that I didn't know was available. And so many gaps are have been filled in and yet it's kind of interesting i suppose who knows us i mean so you i know eric i know nahani and steven and we talk and and even if you know me well you don't really know me and you don't really know those moments that tortured me or shaped me so, I mean, I, 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 I can speak about, you know, they both lived through hunger and torture and um, spouses that were killed and children that were killed. And it's a little bit, what do you do with that information about a parent when you learn that they were had those lives and 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 also who wants to ask hey you know you want to tell me about that horrible period in your life when blah 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 so it's it's um that's another reason this podcast is so fabulous is because in a way like eric said you can step away i can step away it's not my mother my father um but I still get to learn about it. And, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm afraid that I have uh, also experienced a number of decades of therapy, not that I needed it, but I felt sorry for the therapist who needed to buy a new boat. And I, um, but I'm afraid. I mean, I live as though sometimes I was beaten or I was hungry and I'm always a little bit on the reflex of awaiting that blow. Is that blow coming from here or from there or where is that blow? And I should be vigilant about that blow and vigilant when the cudgels hit other people and, and when, when is the time to flee? I mean, this may be way more information than you wanted, but what I find interesting is how, how smart slash stupid this has made me, how nervous, because I know what happened and I know people who were smart enough to flee and who were fearful and didn't flee, you know, anyway, uh, I come to this with both barrels, I'm afraid, you know, both of my, both of my barrels are loaded. So that's, uh, I have a brother who was on kinder transport. I mean, I kind of cover it, you know, it's pretty much if, if, if there was a Holocaust story, somebody I know and, and, and I'm related to, uh, had something right along that alley, uh, like Primo Levi, if you know, if you read that, my father was in the same work 
uh, area as he was. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll stop so other people can speak because otherwise we could just talk for a few hours about it, I think. So thanks for asking. But that's the other thing. Sorry. Thanks for asking. I, 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 it's so important to be asked about these people and about our, my, your connection to these people because what do you do with that material? What do you do with those stories? And they need a, a, a air and they need a venue because there is my story and I'm on the tip of an iceberg too. And I want you to know them and okay, I'll stop. Thank you. I guess, so I'll, I know that other people want to answer this question, but I think that question of what do you do with these stories um, is a very important question for people who work with oral history. Um, and I wonder if Stephen has any more thoughts on that. Well, I would just say that, that um, you, know, you, you don't need to have, as, as powerful as what Eleanor um, just said is, and I thank you for, for sharing that. Um, it really means a lot and it's exactly why you're um, the perfect person to be a part of this project. You don't need some natural organic connection to this story to find this, these, these uh, testimonies in the podcast series um, invaluable and important. Um, you know, I think that uh, just the fact that this, the Holocaust, the, the total war, um, really is such a historical novum and uh, such a significant event that I still impacts uh, much of, uh, of the way we live today. And this, you know, we're still in the post-war period, really. And um, I think it's really dramatically shaped the world we live in and it's uh, and it has inhabited ever since. And so we, we ignore the sort of warning signs that, that each of these stories sort of signal to us at our own peril. And so I, I think you don't need to have uh, an organic connection to the history of the Holocaust in order to, to relate to these materials. Um, they're very, they're very um, relatable to, to, for anyone um, and also completely and dif uh, difficult to understand as well. Um, so in terms of uh, what do we do with these voices, once we've, you know, the goal of the archive, of course, was primarily to, to give a, to give a voice to the voiceless, to give a name to the nameless, sort of large sum of six million, it's this abstract figure to sort of bring it down to one person's story at a time. And um, once we've achieved that, then that's a, that is a, we've achieved a goal in and of itself, but what do we do with the recordings? And, you know, education and outreach has always, has always been a part of the archives um, sort of legacy. And I see the podcast series as, as just another, an attempt to, to fulfill that aspect of, of, of our mission. Um, in fact, uh, in 1983, there's a, a recording of our, one of the archives founders, Jeffrey Hartman, who was a professor at Comp Lit at Yale, and he was himself a refugee from Frankfurt, fled, on, fled to England on a kinder transport. And he said that someday the archive, and this is a quote, well, it can never be complete, it will become an educational institute, something along those lines. So hence, from its very inception, uh, the archive was conceived as a repository, first and foremost, but also uh, a repository that would be used for a kind of enlightenment education, oifklärung, right? And, and at Yale, it's been used that way in teaching and research for decades. Um, I, I present archives, excer uh, excerpts from the archive in classes every year, and you know, we have 100 access sites around the world where people can, can, can view the materials and use them in there. And classroom teaching, we've also had, we've created dozens of edited programs over the years. Some of them are suited for classroom use, others are full length documentaries. One like, for instance, Witness, Voice from the Holocaust, which is very well received. Um, and since the 90s, we've put all that stuff up online and they've been viewed tens of, of thousands of times. But it's um, this podcast series is just one more expansion of of, of that that part of the mission, I think. Um, and uh, I guess I would say that our the, the educational aspect of our mission, however, has maybe received a little less 
uh, focus, and that's because we're a very small operation. And we're only four full-time employees and a and a postdoctoral associate. And uh, uh, our our focus initially with, has been on on the recording process, cataloging, indexing preservation, all of that, which is incredibly uh, rigorous and, and time-consuming work. Um, so that's been our main focus. But as the demographics are shifting, and although we're still recording, or we were recording for the pandemic, um, it, we don't record very many testimonies anymore. And um, now we have to sort of shift focus and think about how to take advantage of available technology to encourage use of this material that we've gathered over the years. Did that answer your question? It does, it does. Um, I, I'm realizing that we're already halfway through the program and I wanna make sure we have a chance to talk about the production process and all of the behind the scenes work. Um, so why don't we take a look at the clip from Sally Frischberg's interview um, Sally Frischberg is the, the first, the interviewee who was highlighted in the first episode of this season. Um, Sam, could you, could you show us that clip? And he took us to his little humble abode in, uh, in, um, in his little town. And uh, he took us upstairs to the attic and uh, there we got up and on the hay we made ourselves comfortable and after we were all up there we uh, he locked the trap door he took away the ladder so that his kids won't come up there and uh, we found that he had prepared for us large pots to use as toilets and that's all there was up there and we just lay there and we lay there day in and day out and there was no way of knowing when or where we are except that my father always knew the calendar and always knew the Jewish holidays and always mentioned that today is whatever it is and I know that one Hanukkah my father attempted to light Hanukkah lights up there by taking a potato making a hole in it putting a little a, a drop of oil in it putting a string of cloth in the oil and lighting it and that was our Hanukkah lights. Uh, so every night, Stasha Grucholsky would open up the, it would bring back the ladder, open up the trap door, raise up to us uh, whatever food he had for us, and the newspaper, and then he would, and, and he would empty out our toilets. And then he would close everything up, and this is how we lived all day until the next night. The big event was Stasha's visit. Thanks, Sam. Um, so I think I'm gonna pose this to Nahani, but I want everyone to be able to jump in. Um, can you tell us a little bit about who Sally Frischberg is um, and why we chose this clip to share? Sally Frischberg grew up in Poland. Um, I believe that she was nine years old when she went into hiding in the Polish farmer's attic. She stayed there for two years. Um, I can talk more about sort of general guiding principles for <laughs> how I choose which interviews to use, but in this particular one, the moment when Sally said that she was silent for two years was the moment when I knew that we would use this testimony. Um, because it's, it's like already un unimaginable that this is what she and 12 members of her extended family are going through. And then you find out that they couldn't talk the whole time. Um, did you want to know about sort of the process for? Yeah, I think what's interesting about this clip is that you hear the story in in the episode, but not every bit of the clip made it piece it in. So how does that process work? How do you when you come to this testimony that's hours and hours long and every bit of it is essential, how do you make that decision? 
Um, right. So every story is, first of all, when we, when we pick who, I mean, that, as you said, that the archive is, has, you know, hundreds of stories in them and everybody's story is worth telling. So the first thing is which ones are most compelling in this format that we're using. Um, an audio format. I mean, so they're all, you know, when I listen, and it's interesting to see Sally's video now because when I edit, I'm only listening to the audio. In fact, even in my first round of listening, I usually start out watching the video, but then I turn it off and just listen because that's the format that we're going to be delivering. So I need to know how a person comes across just that way. And some people have a very immediate and intimate way of telling stories and voice quality that just, and, you know, and there's no right answer. Like there's no formula to this. Um, so you asked about kind of how do we string together a narrative from so many different incidents in a person's life. Um, I mean, there are just hard choices to make. And when we have to cut things, I always tell myself that we're cutting things in the service of making what remains more impactful. Because as we've said, very few people can sit and listen to a three hour interview. Um, so there are a number of considerations. Like we have to make sure that the listener isn't going to get lost and confused as somebody's telling a story. And sometimes I've found myself listening to a story and even though I can rewind and listen over again, I'm still confused. So then I know that that's something that we're, you know, we're gonna have to, to skip in favor of something that comes across more, um, more clearly. I, I could talk about this process a lot. I don't know um, how much detail is interesting now and people can of course ask specific questions. Um, in terms of the process, I begin, as Eric said, with the full three or four hour interview. I generally create a cut that's maybe 30 to 40 minutes and then Eric and I pass it back and forth and listen and talk about it and, and trim it down more. And, and I would add that yeah, yeah. Nahani, to, to sort of underscore just how difficult this work is, um, you know, the testimonies that are the methodology that we use in the video archive really allows for an open ended interview. And so these interviews are, it can be as long as a survivor wants them to be. And they're very, um, you know, they can, they can be disjointed because that's the way that memory works. They, they, they start telling their story from their earliest memories and they continue and memories from the past, uh, from their childhood might um, remind them of something that happened recently, a Pesach with their, with their family in, in Poland and now a Pesach today in, in their new home in the United States. And so you're, it's not linear, it's not chronological. And so it's really challenging to pull that together and create sort of a linear story that sounds natural. Um, and again, much is lost. Uh, there's no way to include a whole life story in a testimony, um, but certainly not in, a, in an edited version, a very short edited version of a, of, of a testimony. Our hope is that this leads those who would be uh, interested to, to come to the archive and perhaps watch the, the unedited program. The other thing I would add that sort of tries to fill in the, the gaps um, the inevitable gaps is the fact that we've asked Sam Cassow, um, historian, professor at Trinity, um, to, to write a, a set of episode notes that accompany the, each episode that he's, he's viewed the whole testimony as well, and he can bring in um, certain aspects and details that, that um, were left out of the episode and other and, and context, historical context that can help the listener understand better. I want to also add that, you know, when a person sits for an interview, even if it's three or four hours, even in, in that moment, they're not able to tell the full extent of, of what they remember or what they went through. So there's always something left out. And I think, um, you know, the, the impact of, of these pieces is really what's important, is, is giving something that 
to, to listeners that they can take in, in the amount of time that they're, you know, um, able to sit. There's, I might also add that, that you gain something with the audio, even though we strip the yeah. audio out of the video, by not watching the person's face and how they say something, you really focus on their voice and hear them. I just watching that clip of Sally Frischberg a short while ago, it was um, almost a shock to see her speak because I know those words, I've heard those words, and they actually have more impact when I listen, especially with earbuds because of the way we are built as humans, that the, our brains are telling us that the sound is, is in the middle of our head. So you feel very close to Sally as opposed to looking at a video screen where there is a separation. So there's a greater, I like to think, and maybe I'm prejudiced because I, I do podcasts, um, that, that audio is a more intimate experience than video. Video gives you other information that's also important. Um, so I like to think that we, we, what we've created is something that's very digestible, however painful it is. Um, and also, Nahani, uh, something I wanted to add, that we are also careful about how much to include, because some of this is so excruciating and so graphic that we don't want to lose our listeners. So we're not, material still exists. You can watch the video um, or listen to the video and get all of it. But um, sometimes we have, to, we have to judge what's too much um, or what's not enough. Um, and so this is mediated. Um, but then again, the original video testimony, testimony is mediated as well. Um, there's no such thing as pure testimony. So you have to trust us the producers, the, Stephen who runs the archive, Eleanor who also works on the scripts, um, you have to trust us to bring you this material in a way that we think um, uh, is something that you will want to hear and will be affected by, because we do want you to be affected by this. Right, and that's, uh, it's important to say that it's, everything is, there is always a, a level of mediation, but I mean, it's not that we're stripping things out in order to um, to make these stories somehow more palatable. Um, we still present the unvarnished truth, and it is difficult, difficult listening. But we also want, or we part of our our, our goal with this series is to to make it um, a useful tool for educational purposes, and we don't necessarily feel that a, a sort of uh, so graphic violence um, in extremists is always, as, as although it is a, a, a very much a part of the story, is what we want to focus on. We're 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 trying to provide a um, not a sanitized version, but a a, a, a true to a, a realistic um, depiction. But some some things we have left out. But also, each episode ends with how the person is now or how they were in the present and, and their families and, and their regeneration and reinvigoration, maybe you know, their, their rebirth or whatever. It, 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 each podcast ends that way with how they are now and the families that they've made in the present, which is also extremely inspiring and m moving too. I think this brings up the question for me, as creators of this podcast, how do you envision your listeners listening to the podcast? I know for many podcasts, you know, it's something we throw into our earbuds and listen to as we're cleaning or shopping for groceries. Um, is this something that you envision people listening to as they're walking around? Do you need to be in a quiet space on your own? Should you be doing, listening to it with other people? Um, what, what do you think? I've, I've you know, told friends that this might not be what you listen to in the background while you're washing the dishes and like getting the kids ready for bed. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I, I think that it just, I think it just takes full concentration. I don't think this is something that you've got on in the background. Um, I hadn't thought about people listening together, but I think that could be a very powerful way to listen. I don't think most people listen to podcasts that way, but um, I would be fascinated to hear if it prompted conversations that wouldn't otherwise have happened. 
yeah, I don't feel comfortable prescribing any particular way of, of listening because everybody's, everybody's different. And, um, you know, I listen, I listen to, uh, to podcasts in all sorts of different modes. And some of them are, are quite difficult to listen to as well and emotionally challenging. And, and so, uh, I, but you know, it's like if you're in a, if you're in your car and you're listening to the news and there's a program that comes on, I don't know how many times I've listened in NPR and there's a report and I just get sucked into it. And that's all that I'm hearing and thinking and end up, you know, sort of parked in the car outside my house and I can't get out of the car because I'm, I'm listening. Right. So, um, is that, is it, would that be an inappropriate way to listen to this? No, I don't think so. So I, I can't, can't prescribe, um, a way, but, you know, one of the thoughts is that it's mediated with the help of a, um, uh, help of a, of a teacher in a classroom, right. For students who, who might be using this podcast series as a, as part of their, let's say mandated Holocaust curriculum, uh, in a, in a high school setting. Um, so some sort of mediation with younger people would be good, but, um, otherwise I don't think we can really prescribe, uh, the right way. I certainly, I certainly don't think, um, there's one right way to listen. Um, but I'm seeing Daphne is asking, do you have a sense of who is listening and how it's being used at this time? We don't have a sense necessarily of who is listening. Um, we can see the numbers of people listening and we know that um, there's a certain amount of overlap between the listeners to our podcast and listeners of Eric's podcast. So for instance, um, we know that uh, certain episodes have been downloaded as many as 18,000 times, but we don't know who those people are unless they leave, you can leave a review or a comment on, on iTunes. Um, uh, we have plans to develop a uh, curriculum package that goes along with the podcast series that would be useful for, for, high, school, um, for high schools. Uh, but it's difficult to, to know who's listening. Um, I, I see a note in here that Shira is asking how I can listen to Sally's testimony. It's live as of today. Um, so that can be heard in a number of different ways. You can listen directly from those who were there.org and play the podcast directly from the website. Um, you can also access those who were there through just about any podcast platform. We'll be picking it up like iTunes or Stitcher if you listen that way. Um, so in addition to Sally's episode, there are also 10 episodes from our first season that are also available um, in both of those places. I mean, the simplest way to listen um, it, for people who aren't regular podcast listeners is to go to the, the website, those who are there.org. And the, you, you can also subscribe to the podcast. I might let somebody else explain exactly how to do that. Um, maybe Stephen, you could walk people through how to do that. It works best if you're a regular podcast listener, I think. Um, Hi guys, it's me. Again. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, let our audience know that I'll include a link to the website and to the podcast and any any other relevant materials in my follow up. Uh, and every everyone that's that registered for today's program will receive a follow up email from me, which will also include a link to the recording of today's program. Um, so we have just a few minutes left, and I did want to leave a little bit of time for audience Q and A. Um, so, uh, we have a question here from our viewer, Ch Charles. Charles would like to know if there's a way that listeners could volunteer their time and their language skills to the project. Well, that's, that's very kind of you, uh, Charles, and that might be something that, um, you could reach out to, uh, to people at, at the folks at the Museum of Jewish Heritage about, um, the video archive generally does not work with volunteers. It's a sort of Yale 
policy. Um, instead, we're lucky enough that we have uh, this wonderfully diverse student body at the university that we rely on who have, have the requisite language skills to help us with the work. Um, but I, I do appreciate the, um, the question. Thank you. Um, also, there's a, a couple questions about uh, where people can access the original videos. Uh, right, so the video archive makes the collection in its entirety available at access sites around the world. Um, and anyone can go to one of those access sites and use the materials. Obviously, that's not really possible right now due to COVID unless you're a student or faculty member at a certain university. So if anyone is interested, we can provide uh, temporary remote access due to COVID. Um, for research purposes, you could just get in touch with me and uh, my email is available on our website, the Fortune Enough Video Archives website. Wonderful, thank you. Um, okay, we, I see a couple more questions coming in. Um, I actually have a question for Treva while these other questions are, are streaming in. Treva, can you tell us what your experience was like coming into the podcast from the museum side? How did you get involved, first of all, and what did you learn from the experience? Um, so that's an interesting question. I think Stephen is laughing because um, I can't remember exactly how I got hooked up with Stephen at the Fortune Off Video Archive. It probably goes back to the fact that the museum has always had a relationship with the Fortune Off Video Archive. So Fortune Off trained the interviewers who conducted the interviews um, at the museum in the 1990s. And those interviews then kind of became part of the bedrock of the inaugural core exhibition at the museum. Um, and I think over the past two years, we've just been working together on a number of projects and knowing that we had this shared collection that we had shared interest in, um, we thought Stephen kindly invited me to be involved in making the second season a Fortune Off MJH collaboration or cooperative effort. Awesome. Thank you, Trevor. Um, here's an, an interesting question. Um, comes from Adele. Adele writes, my parents were both Holocaust survivors who are now both deceased. How many of the people whose stories you will share with us are still alive? And is there any follow-up to the ending of their stories, such as what they are doing today, if they have any great grandchildren, et cetera? Yes. Um, so just a, a, a fraction of the, uh, I think one, one person from last season, Oh, no, no. So uh, two, 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 two from last season, one from this one so far. So Sam Cassow and um, um, uh, um, I'll remember Renee. the name. Renee. Uh, oh, Renee. And also there was one more, um, a man um, whose name suddenly escapes me. Martin. Thank you. Oh, yes, Martin Schiller. Yeah. Uh, Martin Schiller and then Sally Frischberg. So I, what, what we do, what I do is I speak with, in we have to do research and do want to know where someone is in their life if they're still alive. So uh, we now use a genealogist who tracks people down because the archive doesn't necessarily have current contact information. Um, and then I speak with, with the people who are still alive. Um, and if they're not alive, I speak with their children. So, um, but, but most of the people we have featured have, uh, have since died, which makes their, which, which drives home the importance of the fact that these stories were recorded. Um, because they can no longer share their stories in life, but they certainly can still share their stories through these recorded testimonies. Thank you, Eric. Um, here's another very interesting question uh, from our viewer, I think, Il Il Ilana Langer? Sure. No, it's, that's, that's Larry Langer. Oh. Hello, Larry. <laughs> and it's a very good question. You want, you want to go ahead and, and read it? Or? Sure, so um, Larry says, uh, so Eleanor says that the podcast ends with a sense of regeneration and reinvigoration of the survivor. And Eric tells us about the survivor who says that she still feels half dead. How do you reconcile these two? Which is uh, right, he gets, of course, it's Larry Langer. So he gets right to the heart of this tension and contradiction. And um, it's true. And we, we, we don't, um, I don't think we end these 
stories um, with a sense of, well, here's the silver lining. Um, it's more of a nuanced uh, reflection on the fact that despite uh, what they've experienced, despite the fact that they still suffer um, from this experience today, uh, they did, many of them did go on to lead uh, meaningful lives. And so we're not trying to say that it's a sort of happy ever after story um, because not only do people refer to themselves as being half dead, I can't um, ever forget this. It's Charlotte Dobeau who says, I, I died at Auschwitz, but nobody noticed. Um, and so that, that sentiment is more common than not. Uh, and we don't hide that feeling of loss uh, in each episode. I think one thing that made Sally's testimony different or her experience, and I've been thinking about this a lot, why Annalise felt this way and why um, Sally felt the way she did. Sally was nine years old. She was a child. She survived with her parents and with siblings, not all of them. Um, Annalise um, and many of the people we feature were the sole survivors in their families and were adults when they experienced this, this traumatic loss. So, I, so perhaps some, some of the children who lived through this were, because they were children, were more resilient. And if they have their family unit intact, feel less, uh, uh, less a sense of loss. But each one is so different. Um, each one is so different. It's but, just... but, but the other thing is that um, many people express both sentiments simultaneously in the same breath. Yes. Um, you know, many of their closing statements that we have included reflect that ambiguity and that, that struggle to sort of live and, and connect with what they are surrounded by in their, in their present life. Um, and yet, you know, this, this feeling that they'll never forget that they're haunted by it and that it's ever present. So it really is both feelings at once. And, I, and we try very hard to, to bring that across. I think the answer, the short answer is there's no reconciling. There is no reconciling. And, you know, a goal of the archive has always been to, um, to sort of reveal uh, the sort of unvarnished truth, to push back against preconceived notions of what Holocaust history, what Holocaust, what actually happened, and to hear it through the words of the survivors. And so, um, and it's impossible to do justice to that entirely in one episode, even in one testimony, or even in, a, in an archive. I mean, our archive is filled with contradictions and, and lacunae. Um, you know, no archive can ever capture the totality of, of this loss. And that's, that's because like, like David Boder, we never interviewed the dead. And these, these, these survivors are only standing into as representations of those who, who cannot um, could not share their story. So we can only offer uh, a piece of the puzzle and, and, and sort of help listeners grasp um, what they know, what they don't know, and, and give them an opportunity and a launching point for them to, to learn more. Wonderful. Thank you guys. That's just about all the time we have for today. Um, thank you so much for, for this program, for all that you do. Everyone should go out and uh, look out for the upcoming season of those who are there. I'll send out a link to the website in my follow-up, as I said, as well as a link to the recording of this program. Uh, and thank you, Treva, for, for moderating on behalf of the museum. This was really wonderful. Well, I just want to thank all the panelists and every, for everything that you've shared. Um, it's, it's really meaningful, and I think it's really important. Fantastic. Thanks, Treva. Thanks, Thanks Sam. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks everyone for being here. Take care. Signing off.